You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another awesome edition of the Ask Drone You new show. Today you'll be joining myself and our good friend, the Flying Dutchman, all the way, that's right, from the other side of the country, the United States, to clarify. And we are here to deliver this week's drone news to you. Starting up this week, and just to get right into it, it seems like the Flying Dutchman and myself have been on to the writing on the wall as we have been showcasing how you could be expected to see a DJI or a Chinese ban on drones. We've talked about all these American contractors who are building up drones for, that's right, military and commercial purposes. So what's really going on? In our first piece of news this week, it looks like the Flying Dutchman has uncovered another set of drone companies who are now jumping on the tidal wave saying, hey look guys, remote ID as proposed, is not going to work whatsoever. Haya, what do you have? Yeah, uh, this week we're expecting by the end of the month to get the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act to be published. And in that act, uh, we, have, we haven't seen the literal wording, uh, unfortunately, of course, but in the act, it seems that Chinese drones and probably even drones with Chinese made parts would be banned for federal use. And one of the alliances that has stepped up now is the Alliance for Drone Innovation, which includes, uh, for instance, DDI, but uh, also 3DR, GoPro and a whole range of other companies. And they've sent a letter expressing their concerns for such a possible ban on Chinese-made drones. And they say that in the long term, the drone industry in the United States would actually be hurt by such a ban. We're not quite sure, of course, since it's 5 to 12, if you will. I mean, this bill is supposed to be finalized uh, by the end of this month, meaning tomorrow. Uh, We're not quite sure if a letter so late in the game is still going to be very effective. We agree, though, however, with their statement that if you ban Chinese made drones and even drones that include parts that are made in China, that would not be good for the drone industry at all. And as far as I know right now, I don't think there's any drone in the United States, not even from Skydio, uh, not uh, the one from Parrot. I don't think FreeFly either uh, has any uh, aircraft, unmanned aircraft that does not contain any parts that aren't made in China. I think it's pretty much impossible at this point in time to make a drone uh, without Chinese made parts. Anyway, this act is a big deal because if it is to be banned, then of course federal use of such drones would no longer be allowed. We hope that this letter is gonna be effective and that they're gonna rethink their decision and uh, hopefully scratch it from the act. But uh, yeah, it remains to be seen and it's uh, it's a big deal. It's probably the biggest piece of news this week we have. Yeah, and I know that we're expecting more news this week when we do expect to see the National Defense Defense Authorization Act come out, even on the heels of a potential government shutdown at the end of the week. I'm not sure where we sit with that. That said, you know, Haya, this is pro and con, right? What I love to see is other drone companies realizing what we have been saying since day one of Remote ID being released, which is this is bad. It's unpractical. To follow these guidelines actually makes drone flying fundamentally less safe. In addition, you inhibit the kids, the STEM education, the elementary schools, the middle schools, the high schools from flying hobby drones, even that's right on site of their school where they're learning. With all of these restrictions, everyone questions who wrote remote ID? Well, it was someone higher who was having a lot of money dangling in front of their face and not understanding what real life drone operations are. And that really makes me wonder, Haya, was the person writing Remote ID trying to catch a fish with a drone and then realize what a great idea it was? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) That's a, that's a good question. I'm curious what our viewers will have to say in the comments about that one, but uh, it's, a, it's a tough one to answer. It is a tough one to answer, albeit it is exciting to see these people kind of coming in line and helping the drone industry. Just like you said, though, when it's this late in the game, when it's one day before we're supposed to be reading over the newly released rules, how effective are these associations? How effective will this letter be? 
Yeah, and I think uh, this one actually follows another letter that was sent by the drone companies that actually are in favor of banning Chinese drones. And that is, uh, I believe, pretty much the same group that is also uh, in contract now with uh, the Department of Defense to make drones specifically designed for the military use. And you know that includes uh, Parrot, Skydio, Teal. It's that group of drone companies. I would just like to see one of those drones in real life. That's all I have to say. In our next piece of news, it looks like uh, Google Wing is expanding their drone delivery operations. And Haya, as we had predicted about drones really being the next driver of the industrial revolution as drones really speed up the time it takes from e-commerce to delivery at home. Haya, what has taken flight in Australia that, well, could have taken flight here in the United States if we wouldn't have had so many regulatory rules and environments and systems that just completely destroy innovation. I don't know. Yeah, it would be nice, right, if this would have taken place in the United States rather than in Australia. However, uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Since 2012, Wing, which is a subsidiary of Google, which is a subsidiary of uh, Alphabet, has been conducting drone flights in Australia. They've actually performed more than 100,000 drone flights as of uh, today. So that's quite a bit of uh, drone flying that has been going on down there. A lot of experience, and since COVID-19, since the coronavirus pandemic kicked in this year, Google has seen a surge in orders that's been delivered with drones of up to 500%. So a lot of people down in Australia, and I mean, that would make sense. That would have happened elsewhere as well, I would imagine. A lot of people don't want to have contact with other people. They don't want to go to the store. They don't want somebody coming to the door delivering something. So what they do is they order online with the app from Wing. And then in a few minutes, a Wing drone comes over, basically hovers over your house, drops the package and releases it automatically. So you, you don't really need to do anything. You just pick up the box and you get your coffee or your candy or whatever little household products you just ordered. And apparently this has been so appealing uh, for people that these kind of orders for Wing have increased fivefold, which is pretty tremendously. We've seen a similar search in Christianburg, Virginia, where Wing is also conducting the, a similar project. And there they've even extended it to uh, fly books from the public library to school kids during the summer and they've seen a massive increase in deliveries by drone there as well so it seems like it makes a lot of sense it also makes you wonder what's going to happen in the future right i mean because right now we don't really have the legal framework in place we don't really have the ideal drones yet there are only a handful of companies that can actually perform these kind of flights we're still dealing with flying over people flying at night flying um, beyond visual line of sight all that stuff so imagine if those restrictions finally would go away how this new industry might take off. And I think not just for big retail companies, but even for smaller mom and pop uh, stores, which are exactly the kind of businesses that have been uh, dealing with Wing, I think we're gonna see a resurgence in their business if they can provide similar customer service as let's say, for instance, uh, Amazon can do. So yeah, we're pretty excited about this. The Assistant Secretary of Aviation, at the ministry or the Department of Infrastructure, his name is Simon Morris, said that uh, he thinks that one day there will be hundreds of thousands of drones in the sky and that you would need something like artificial intelligence to basically manage the unmanaged aviation aspect with the manned aviation. So he's definitely somebody who's seen the light and who's seen the future. Yeah, I can only say that we can't wait for this to become reality. Yeah, not, you know, you made some really good points in regards to how this could be helping mom and pop businesses, the smaller entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurism, as we know, is really one of the only ways to wealth. So it's awesome to see that Wing is really helping those businesses. But you also brought up another great point of what would the world look like if we didn't have these regulatory restrictions on BVLOS, on things like flight over people, flight at night, which are all, all restrictions here in the United States. I would ask you, Haya, the question of how much of the regulatory environment would have changed or have looked different if the people actually regulating had a desire to actually understand what they're regulating. And so the perfect example that I would like to bring up is the former FAA administrator, Mr. Huerta, who was very, very clear about getting part 107 done, getting it on the books, but he was very clear too that he would not listen to anyone, especially drone pilots. In fact, the attitude, I, I, it took everything in me to not 
literally want to smack the guy in the face. But time always tells what's really going on. Mr. Huerta is now a executive board member at a counterintelligence firm that focuses on, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, counterintelligence on drones. So at what point do we ask our federal government, look guys, I think the writing is on the wall that the FAA clearly does not understand practical drone operations. And we're really fearful and afraid that the FAA could actually cause a serious crisis that also will not be able to be managed because once again, the leadership, the management doesn't understand a lot of just simple nuanced information about operating these vehicles, the operating restrictions and limitations, et cetera. And so at what point, Haya, do we as a community just stand up and reach out to Congress and reach out to our our senators and say, uh, you know, the FAA's sole mission is to what? Create a safe national airspace system. Okay. Mm -hmm. How have they done that with what they did with the 737 MAX? Now, what if drones start colliding with planes because these rules that have been implemented were not thoroughly thought out by someone who actually flies drones, and so all these potential problems were just outright ignored? At what point does Congress say, FAA, you are not keeping the airspace safe because you are not seeking to understand what real operations look like, limitations, problems, how to solve them? And then if you can't understand that, how are we going to actually seamlessly integrate the drones that we have? now with these more complex advanced operations of the quote unquote UTM. And I think everyone is seeing this train is off of the rails already. It's just a lot of drone pilots are closing their eyes and wondering when is the massive crisis going to occur where a drone and a plane and something bad happens. And I hope that never happens. And I hope that as humans, we don't have to learn the hard way, right? But laws of human nature say otherwise. I think in an uh, in an ideal world, it would have been nice, and I'll slow down to make sure that I pronounce these letters in the right order. Uh, you would need an FUAA, a Federal Unmanned Aviation Administration. And let's say if we had such an agency uh, a couple of years ago already, and if you had all the legal framework in place, or at least most of it that would allow for drone test projects. And the IPP program, of course, takes care of some of it, but it would have been nice perhaps to see that even earlier and even on a larger scale where you get more companies trying things out, because in the end, you can only make the rules based on on the experience, right? Once you know what works and what doesn't work. So I think trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work, the fastest way to do that would be to have a lot of different drone projects going on in remote areas where there's hardly any danger, any risk involved, or for instance, here, upstate New York, where you have this whole drone testing corridor in Rome. New York and test things out and try things out. But I think the problem with the FAA is that they're they're doing unmanned aviation and unmanned aviation. And I think they're so much more catered towards the manned aviation than the drone world that it's hard for them to potentially give as much time and dedication to the drone world and also have the people that actually understand the drone world to facilitate such a process. So If you were to be able to do a lot of this kind of testing, then I think the rulemaking process will probably be able to go faster as well because they would know what kind of rules would be required. And then this future might be coming at us much, much faster than it currently is. Right now, I think the FEA is trying to rush things along anyway because remote ID was going to take three years plus a year for implementation, which will bring us to 2024. Now it's going to be finalized by the end of this year, which makes you wonder if they even listen to the 53,000 comments that were submitted. And they need to rush it because the remote ID components is the basis for all the other steps that we need, which includes flying beyond visual line of sight, the UTM, flying over people, flying at night, all that good stuff. So they're trying to rush it already. But I mean, if you kind of take a step back, we've been in this process, what, since 2011 or 12, trying to figure out how to make this all work. And let's say it's going to be 10 years since that moment before we have potentially a working model, which, uh, yeah, is still a very slow progress if you compare that to how fast the drone industry itself has been progressing and how we see different drones that have appeared in the market, but also different use cases for drones that uh, probably 10 years ago, nobody ever had foreseen that were going to take place. So I think in an ideal world, yes, we would have an unmanned division of the FEA, I would also change that name and uh, have that focus just on the drone world. You know, you're not the first person to bring this up to me, actually. There are a couple of people who are government employees who have even mentioned this. They're like, you know, it seems like with 
the, the FAA is stretched super thin, especially with employees. Most of their people are retiring right now because of the age group. In addition, you have people and leadership who just refuses to really learn the practical applications. And that showcases a serious divide of ideology, right? Entrepreneurs, business owners, we learn by, that's right, doing. In fact, I'm not sure that you can learn any faster way. The faster you fail, the faster you'll be successful. Yeah. You know? And so here's the thing, though, is that the government now has failed repeatedly, and we continue to make the same mistakes. And at what point will we change that? There's one thing I want to add. I mean, um, just look at the companies. Zipline is an American-based company. Where are they flying their drones? It's all happening in countries like Rwanda in Africa. Wing is an American company. Where are they doing their testing? It's happening in Australia. Amazon, an American company. Where were they doing their initial drone flights? It was happening in the UK. Like, what's wrong in, in our world here that United States-based companies cannot perform their own product testing and their own drone flight tests in their own country why do we have to go across the world in order to fly these drones you know what's so ridiculous Haya, is we said this on a podcast in 2015 we said look at what happened with the wright brothers everyone says america yeah. was first to aviation sure we were first to take flight and we were the last place to sell airplanes where did the wright brothers take their first airplane to sell it oh yeah that's right france okay yep. and we made the mistake again weird Right. I agree yeah. with you so much, Haya. I'm like, oh, I don't know what to say anymore. It's frustrating, but hopefully we'll get there. I mean, um, I think what is good to see is that these companies uh, are not being slowed down by the U.S. government. They're like, all right, if we can't play here in this country, we'll play somewhere else. We'll test somewhere else. We'll progress somewhere else. And I think long term that goes at the expense of the United States because you miss that experience, you miss the talent and, and you miss all the development that's taking place. But these companies are not going to slow down. And if you look at Zipline, for instance, they've done a tremendous job in Africa, uh, life saving work, being able to get blood samples and medication to people in need. And they've set up a massive operation and it's been ongoing for a couple of years now. I think they're up to like 200,000 flights, if I'm not mistaken. So that's double what Wing has been doing. It's a shame that that is not taking place right here. You know, it makes you wonder, Haya, at what point are they just crushing small business owners and only serving these hyper, hyper, these hyper advanced and hyper leveraged companies like, you know, Wing is Google's company. They probably have infinite funding, right? But what about the mom and pop that are just trying to do their own thing and learn themselves. And I think that's why people have just decided, you know what, we're just gonna go ahead and do these things, learn from it, and provide the FAA with data on how we learn from it, and then it'll be kosher and it'll be okay. You know, we've seen that yeah. numerous times, right? That's yeah, but not okay. The problem is it's not okay, because if you look at DJI, I mean, why is DJI based in China? Because in China, you have that whole drone ecosystem, right? I mean, in Shenzhen, they can, I mean, this is what they've told us literally, it's like they can walk out their office, go across the streets, talk to manufacturers and suppliers, get the parts they need, and then modify their prototypes and start testing it the same day. So their turnaround cycle is much, much faster than any other drone company. And I think with companies like Wing and Zipline, you see the same thing happening. I mean, where where do people get the experience with these drones? It's happening in Australia, it's happening in Rwanda. Now with Zipline starting their first tests here in the United States, they bring people over from Rwanda, an entire team, to help the people in the United States to figure out how to run this stuff. So already you can see that the talent is being developed overseas. It's not being developed here in the United States. And I think that should be worrisome long term because you're, you're not feeding that pipeline of talents that ultimately are going to bring us to the next level and come up with the next breakthrough and make the next drone or the drone use case that we haven't even thought of yet. So let me get this straight. They're crushing the entrepreneurs. They're crushing drone pilots and talent. And this is all yeah. because they don't understand practical applications and thus they cannot yeah. regulate effectively. Okay, so now they're developing talent outside of the United States. I mean, seriously, at what point does someone with enough money just sue the FAA and say, you're really not actually keeping the airspace safe at all. You don't understand practical operations and the data that you have is insufficient when we know there's what 80 something million flights happening every year and you have what 800,000 uh, yeah. registered. I'm sorry, but that's a total failure. Um, at yeah. what point do we go to Congress? Do we go to the president? And do we say, 
guys, we are hurting ourselves on every level just so government employees can cover their ass. And that's just at the beginning of the drone industry, right? I mean, already we're, we're dramatically outnumbering manned aviation. Already we're over 100 times safer with no uh, casualties uh, as, as of yet. And that's at the beginning. We're just scratching the surface. I mean, all the things that Wing are doing and a Zipline are doing, and even with the IPP program in the United States, those flights, as impressive as they are and whatever their numbers are, they're nothing compared to what it eventually will be like. So um, rather than having the FAA that is dedicated to manned aviation rule the drone industry almost like a sideshow or sidekick, you would need an FUAA that is dedicated on the drone industry. And before you know it, that part is going to be much bigger than manned aviation. It's, that's just a matter of time. I couldn't agree more, Haya. And I love what you're kind of alluding to on having an unmanned version of the FAA. In fact, your nomenclature should probably win a Pulitzer Prize, but I, who am I to say that? <laughs> Let's start with a t-shirt, F-U-A-A. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think we should. Last time I said something like that, someone uh, copyrighted a phrase I've been using for years, and I'm like, you must not understand copyright, my friend, but okay, whatever, uh, which was fly like a boss, by the way. That was funny, but yeah. I agree with you. F-U-A-A, maybe we should just uh, start a t-shirt trend. And I mean, our regional office is walking distance, so I would love to just go out there and wear that. But yeah. you're also alluding to something which I think is much more important. I think the government needs to hear this. And I know various agencies do listen to our shows, and we're very grateful for that. And I would say, at what point are we handicapping our entire industry, our entire country, our entire um potential employees, freelancers, entrepreneurs who are studying um, science and math. At what point are we just handicapping our entire country and the people who live here? It's already happening. I mean, look at look at one of the biggest crises is taking place right now with all the wildfires up and down the Californian coast, right? The Department of the Interior, who's supposed to manage all the lands, uh, is not allowed to use Chinese-made drones or drones with Chinese-made parts. So they've grounded their entire fleet of, I believe, 810 drones, some of which are 3DR solos, some of them are DJI drones, and they cannot be used unless in like the most urgent emergency cases. So these drones cannot be used to monitor wildfires they cannot be used to um, uh, burn certain sections to either stop or prevent a wildfire from taking place. So it's, it's already happening. I mean, on one hand, it's the restrictive regulation from the FDA. On the other hand, it's the whole data security problem where people think that these drones uh, are spying on us. It's hindering us in the work that needs to be done. And if, if you look at it long term, it's probably even much, uh, a much bigger problem. All right, Haya, when are we starting the GoFundMe to start up a lawsuit? Because I know three other groups who are doing it, and yeah. uh, we know the leadership of those groups. Love them. Maybe we should reach out to them at some point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or maybe we start our own. Who knows? Yeah. So yeah. we have seen a lot of nefarious people come in and just further divide and let the FAA yeah. conquer. And at what point are you like, look, Internet trolls, it doesn't matter what you say. It matters what happens in real life. <laughs> you know, so and I guess you could call me an Internet troll. In other more positive news, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like drones have once again, that's right, saved a life. And no, it did not ride a cowboy. What are we talking about here, Haya? Ah, two stories, two stories. The first one is somebody who got lost, a 16-year-old missing. A boy from Vancouver, 16 years old, goes by the name of Anthony Mancuso. Hopefully I said that correct. He went missing suddenly uh, near Mount St. Helens and apparently he was going to take a leak or something and his parents, his family members that he was hiking with couldn't find him anymore and he was lost. He was gone. They eventually found his shoes, but they didn't find the boy or the teenager and they actually mounted quite the search and rescue party. They had over 100 people involved in searching uh, for this individual they had it all mapped out. We had two helicopters, one from the U.S. Coast Guard involved. It took almost 32 hours. So this guy went lost. He went missing on Sunday and he wasn't found until 9.15 p.m. on Monday evening. And he was found, and I'll let you guess, 
by a drone that was outfitted with a thermal camera. So you have two helicopters, 100 people, and guess who finds this guy? It's a drone with a thermal camera. Now, on this show, we've had, I don't know how many stories about drones being used for good and drones that are involved in locating people. Just the fact that you have a drone is a good thing when you're looking for somebody, but to have a drone with a thermal camera makes it 10 times better. A thermal camera, if you have the right resolution, the right camera, you can look for heat signatures in the landscape super efficiently you can fly close to bushes you can fly around the rocks you can get into places where a helicopter wouldn't be able to go or at least not safely so uh, it's a short story but at the same time uh, he was found he was not harmed and he was found with the help of a drone with a thermal camera and i think that's something that we can't stress enough Definitely, Haya, as drones continue to save lives, it definitely makes you think that the regulatory environment that we talk about will become increasingly more and more important. In addition, when drones can't be flown to help uh, search for people, well, then you're going to have more lone wolves come out and essentially be like, you know, screw what everyone says regulatory wise. We're either saving a life or not. Um, And, you know, Gene Robinson has really been a big proponent of that for years. And he's just like, when it comes to life, why are we going to let some Yahoo in Washington tell us what we can and can't do when we've got someone's literal life, you know? And that's something that I actually pushed back on Gene on for a while. And I think I was wrong to do that. I think that Gene's got a point, you know, when when life is at risk, uh, you know, as long as we don't, you know, obviously uh, endanger other lives, right? If, if you're the one who's lost and let's say you're injured, you're not mobile, you can't save your own uh behind, uh, you would hope that somebody would throw a drone up in the air with the thermal camera and locate you, right? I mean, if if you're the one who is in need of help, you would hope that somebody would do this. So yeah, I would agree. Um, Forget, well, you can't forget the regulations, but I think the regulations should allow for drone use in these kind of emergency situations. Hold on. You just said it, Haya. Oh, I love it when you say 107 things. Oh, I love it. Okay. Under part 107, Haya. When can we ignore all of FAA regulations according to the FAA? In the case of an emergency, everyone use it. Use it, use it, use it. (laughs) I am not a lawyer. Use it. (laughs) Let's hope that the Department of the Interior hears this as well. You would think that a wildfire is quite the emergency, right? It goes to show why the rules of geniuses include checking your sources, Hayat. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) On that bombshell, let's uh, find out how drones are just saving another life. Please, please. Yeah, this, well, this is not necessarily life yet, but for sure in the future. It's kind of stock so, advice, Hi, It just depends on the timing. It could be right or wrong. Oh, you will be right eventually. Um, <laughs> in the United States, about 100,000 people are waiting for a kidney transplant. And about 12 of these people die every single day because no kidneys are available. At the same time, in the United States, 3,500 kidneys are discarded every year because they cannot get to the right person in time to help save that person's life. So how does this factor into drones? Uh, In Las Vegas, they use drones to make a delivery with a a human kidney. So they transport as an organ using a drone over 10 miles. And it was actually the second flight. They had two flights. The first one was a much shorter flight. This happened on September 17th. The first flight was only two and a half miles. And then later that day, they had a second flight delivering research kidneys. So this was not like a real case where somebody was in need of a kidney. It was a research kidney from an airport to a location outside of a small town in the Las Vegas desert, 10 miles away. And they had... um, doctors doing biopsies on the kidney before the drone flight and after the drone flight to see if anything would have changed to that organ. They said there was nothing noticeable. I mean, the drone flight seemed to have no effect on the uh, on the organ. The only thing that was mentioned is that this drone, it is, it's more like a small size helicopter, if you will, uh, can carry 22 pounds, but these organs need to be kept super, super cold. So they're looking for bigger drones that can carry a bigger payload, not because they're going to transport 10 kidneys at once, but they want to be able to pack that one kidney with more ice to keep it at the right temperature. One part of this story takes us back to 2007 when six members of a transplant team of the University of Michigan Health System died when their jet crashed into Lake Michigan. This is 2007. So the argument here is that if you transport organs by drones, 
there are not going to be any casualties because this is an unmanned aircraft, obviously. I mean, if it crashes on the ground, you don't always know what happens there, but at least we're not flying people through the air to transport human organs. So another use case for drones, I think one that should definitely be tested. I mean, if you look at all the news stories where drones have been very useful, it seems that they add the most value in very urgent and um situations where lives are at stake. So either we're talking about missing people who've been found with the use of drones or cases like this, where you are able to use a drone to transport human organs to a person in need very, very quickly. And it seems that in these kind of cases, the drones add the most value, more I would argue than let's say uh, ordering a cup of coffee in the morning from uh, that's gonna be delivered by a wind drone. Wow, I couldn't agree more. Lots of, lots of uh, inferences there. And I couldn't agree with you more. When we have unmanned drones crash that are delivering things, typically the only thing that is crushed is the drone and someone's confidence, albeit yeah. not their life. So thank you, Haya, for joining me again today on these news pieces and so much more. This is going to be a big week of news. We'll be back later this week with another episode of Drone News to cover what we think is going to be pretty big on the NDAA. So thanks again for joining us. If you do have a drone or business-based question, go ahead, send it in to askdroneu.com. We're also going to open that up now for the news show. So if you've got pieces of news that you think should be covered or you want us to cover for whatever reason, send them in, askdroneu.com. There's a little, that's right, link that you can submit something. We would love to know. There's obviously way more going on than we could ever understand with our small team, and we would love to hear from you. So if you do have something, go ahead, send it in. But Flying Dutchman, thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, pleasure being on the show and good point that you make. I mean, uh, we're always looking forward to hear back from the viewers and curious to hear what you guys uh, are thinking about these news articles. Definitely. And we want to keep it to news articles, not our hairstyles. On that bombshell, that's going to do it for us today. This is the Ask Drone You News Show. Oh, hi, your hair's way better than mine. Don't worry. Oh, way better, way better. <laughs> <laughs>